Hi, this is Gilbert Gottfried, and this is Gilbert Gottfried's amazing colossal podcast with my co-host Frank Santo Padre. And we're once again recording at Nutmeg with our engineer Frank Verderosa. Our guest this week is an actor, writer, and one of the most admired and influential stand-up comedians of his generation. As an actor, you've seen him in feature films like Leaving Las Vegas, Drunks, Vamps, The Wrong Guys, Robin hey. Hood, Men in Tights. Mike, stop it there. <laughs> that <laughs> you don't want to hear anymore. What about what about curb your enthusiasm for seventeen? He's years? getting to that. That that yeah, that one's coming up. Uh, don't yell at me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and hit TV shows. Like The Simpsons, The Larry Sanders Show, Seventh Heaven, Two and a Half Men. I was the only Jew on Seventh Heaven, by the way. (laughs) And you played a rabbi. He did. I I ad-libbed the entire show. And and I think uh, Lorraine Newman was your wife. And you're right. What are we? Yeah, you're right. She was. Yeah, it was, she was. She's brilliant. I love her. Yeah. Go on. What, what's yeah. next on this? His on own this co-starring bullshit. vehicle, anything but love, and the iconic HBO series, Curb Your Enthusiasm, which is about to begin its ninth season. And that's not all. He's the author of two books, Reflections from Hell and the Other Great Depression. And he's written and starred in several HBO and Showtime comedy specials, including I'm in Pain, I'm Exhausted, I'm Doomed, and Magical Misery Tour. In a career spanning five decades, he's worked with legends like Alan Arkin, Jack Lemmon, Don Rickles, as well as Amazing Colossal Podcast guests Richard Belza, Ileana Douglas, and Peter Bogdanovich. Hell, he's even worked with Georgie Jessel. (laughs) Please welcome to the show a man Mel Brooks once called the Franz Kafka of modern day comedy. One of the funniest humans on the planet and one of the greatest stickball players to ever play the game, our pal Richard Lewis. Gilbert, I'm glad I wrote that. I'm glad you read it. Um, I'm embarrassed by all of that shit, and uh, I just want to be here with you. I'm 70. I just turned 70, and, uh, you know, the the clock is ticking. So I want you to ask some meaningful questions, philosophy questions, you know, things about Hegel and Nietzsche and things like that. I don't want to talk about what do you think, who is funny, who is this, who is better than him, and who is a bullshit artist who stole material. I don't care. Do you care? Okay, maybe we could talk about what, who is, oh, Keebler Ross. Uh, Elizabeth uh, Keebler uh, Ross. Uh, Ross. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Who no, wrote Keebler the- Ross was the uh, <laughs> the cracker. It was the cracker. <laughs> yeah, yo, Keebler. Yes, yeah, she came yeah, in. He was a little she- cracker, rich cracker. Her husband said she came in many flavors. <laughs> and, uh, you mean uh, the death and dying yes, author? Yeah, Elizabeth yes. Kubler Ross. Now, do you now, Richard? Yes. Boy, do you thank know- God you have him next to you because you're a moron and you know that, and he's brilliant. <laughs> now, Richard. Do, you must Ross. know the five stages of, of grief. Death. Of, yes. Yeah. I I do, but I don't like to mention it because it hexes me. Yes, I'd like it. Uh, All right. I know the first the first stage is uh, podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The second to the fourth are podcasts, <laughs> and the fifth the fifth one is dying during yes. the podcast. <laughs> I, I this is my one hundred and eighty six thousand radio show and podcast, and I this might be it for me because I wanted to because I I consider you a genius, honest to God, and I and I wanted to be on with you, and that's it. I don't know they're they're calling me for, you know they call you for everything. Listen, can Richard bake a cake? Can he come on? I can't take it anymore. <laughs> you know why? Because I'm older than most of the comedians. And most of them have passed away, you know, in our generation. You know, I'm a little ahead of you. 
and they, they expect me to do everything. I can't take it. The pressure is driving me fucking nuts. And how do you feel about getting on a plane or a train to go? Nice do segue, a job? by the way. Jack Ruby segue. Uh, why don't you just shoot me in the belly? <laughs> What kind of segue was it? Let me ask you something. He doesn't how do segues, Rich. Getting, no, because you were talking <laughs> yes. about all the things you hate. Oh, the now, oh, I see. Yeah. So I was thinking about, like, the older you get, and and it's like getting on a plane or a the train worst. or uh, traveling to do a job in the middle of nowhere. I think we were supposed to do a show together. About a year ago yeah, or so. Yeah, I know, but I fell off my roof. The what? In my ha- I fell off my roof, and I was fractured my wrist, and I was out for seven months. Yes. Yeah, we see- were, and that's why I canceled. Did you do the show? Who did you do it with? I don't remember. I think I, oh, I think I did do the show. How and was I your think- memory, by the way? The what? Is your short-term memory, is it as bad as- <laughs> How's your memory, he wants to know. <laughs> do you know who you're talking to now? <laughs> you know it's me, right? <laughs> yes. You know what you did to me once and no it's it's visual. No one I we were in yeah. front of the improv at, about 20 years ago and I hadn't seen you in a while <laughs> and you put your arms up like you wanted a hug. And then I turned around, I was scared a little bit, and then I walked a block and I turned around and you put your arms out again to hug. You did it for an hour to <laughs> hug me. And only you can do that. You know, you know how to you know how to do that. You know, by the way, uh, you know, people people want to know how how much how much do you improv and and how much I improv. You improv a tremendous amount, don't you? It depends on the night. Some nights like up if, some nights I'm up there, uh, I I could be doing my laundry as I'm doing my act. Right, so if you're doing your act, if it's a bad, but if it's a great audience and you're cooking, then you could just oh, go yeah. wild. Like if it's a corporate gig for the clan, you might just do your <laughs> act and get off. Hey, I when when they said you agreed to do the podcast, yeah. I saved this letter. Oh no! That I got from you. What really? Yeah. I I I saved it. It's when my first child was born. I wrote you for that. Oh, yes, there's, and there's a headshot attached. There's a headshot too, for a present for the baby. Yeah. <laughs> what, a, what a narcissist I am! Holy <laughs> Christ! To my genius pal Gilbert, the news of you having a baby even has me speechless. <laughs> oh, okay. Gilbert, I love you. I can't imagine how the mother of your baby to be. I'm shocked that you decided to have offspring considering how twisted your sperm DNA is. (laughs) Gilbert, I'm so fucking happy for you, a father. Wow, that poor kid. Don't call me for advice. You're on your own. (laughs) That's nice. That said, perhaps your genius and love, but none of your cheapness will bless this kid and make him, if not the Messiah, then the greatest baby ever. I'm so happy for you. I pray the mother has milk because I know (laughs) you'll be too cheap to buy formula. (laughs) Please don't make me the godfather. Because whatever fuck you money I have is for me and my wife. I will un... Oh, As Gilbert's I, cell phone course, goes off yeah. in the middle of this tender moment. Uh, That's right. Uh, <laughs> and, you always have Hong Kong music yeah. when the phone goes off? Okay. Uh, whatever fuck you money I have is for me yeah. and my wife will undoubtedly be wiped out. All of this aside... I pray you have a personality bypass and become the best head of all. Love, Richard. What, Thank- do, you, what do you make of that? Yeah, I I kept it. Where, where do you keep it in? Your, like a sock drawer? Or is, it, uh, like a, is it like a rose? It's like a rosebud for us. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're not a particularly sentimental person, so the fact that you kept that all these years. Oh, you yeah. Because you don't keep anything. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was very nice. 
Or he intends to put it on eBay. I thought it was I thought it was more than nice. I thought it was uh, particularly funny. Yeah, it was funny. It was nice. But uh, you know, look, you know, there's, you know, how many shows do you think you've done in in forty plus years? Do you have oh, any clue? It's scary. Isn't it scary? Thousands and yeah. thousands. Is it a blur to you now? Do you do you enjoy the journey that you were on? I mean, I tell young comedians, you know, they get so crazy about one night. I go, it's not one night. It's an entire life. You know, you got to dedicate your whole life to your craft. You know, don't get so excited about one show. It's crazy, you know. I yeah, mean, it's, that's early on where you start yeah. going, oh, my God, I just did a great show. Right. At so-and-so. And it, it's like. You find they all blend together. It, it's a blur. When I leave radio, like if I'm doing eight radio shows for a club or a, or a venue, as soon as I leave the station, I have no idea who I was talking to. I just can't. I, I'm too burned out. I'm just too, I, but I can turn it on when they talk to me. But afterwards, I just want to get back to the hotel. And when you're in a hotel, do you have to hide? By the way, or when, do you like to be noticed all the time when no, you go when, down? No, when I'm in a hotel, I'm usually, my my day Washing is, your socks. In the yes, sick, yeah. I'll wash my socks and underwear, <laughs> and that's in right. the evening. Oh, okay. Where do you do that? Do you have a bar sink? Uh, yeah, I have a sink. You know, yeah. well, all oh, yeah, in the bathroom, the sink. bathroom, right? I'm not right. bragging that I have a sink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I become that biggest star. I never knew you had sinks in your hotel room. Yes. that's 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 news to me. I'll I like watch horrible television. Yeah, and and then I like you know, uh, go pee, look at myself in the mirror. Watch more TV, ride down the elevator, see that there's no place to walk around the right. hotel, and right. then go back and watch TV and look at myself and pee again. What about the phone? I don't know how you feel about it. I mean, I, I, love, I love performing when I'm cooking and I'm on stage, but when that phone rings in the hotel, particularly if there's, I don't like to do two shows anymore. I just don't like to do it. I'm just, you know, after 48 years, I just don't want to. Oh yeah. And it's I just can't do it. You know, like 11 o'clock, you know, you get home and one. So, but when that phone rings, I'm downstairs, I'm re I'm filled with horror, filled with horror. And you know, maybe you have a better attitude. Right? Maybe you can't wait to get on stage, but I don't have an act. So I don't know what I'm going to say. So it's pretty frightening. No, I, I've said this a few times on the show, like when right before I'm about to go on stage or that time yeah. waiting backstage, I right. always have this fantasy that the club owner will come back and say, <laughs> we had a fire or a flood in the club. <laughs> uh, here's your check. You could take the next plane. As home. long as it involves getting the check. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. So that's that's a great fantasy. Oh yes, yes. Oh and, God, that that's fantastic. And I, I remember I, too being at a club, and this one sticks with me as yeah. one of these great moments where I had just done the first show, and then I was sitting back in the guy's office. Well, to, oh, you stay in the club. You don't go back to the hotel. No, most of the time it's too far away. Okay, I got you. And and then uh, I'm sitting in the guy's office, dreading, thinking, how am I going to go on again? And the guy says, well, you uh -huh. ready? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, put your jacket on. Let's." Go. And I said, wait, isn't there a second show? And he goes, no, tonight's only one show. And you stayed in the office like a schmuck? Yeah, yeah, I was sitting there until he told me. And and I thought, wow, that was the greatest news I had heard. <laughs> That's fact. Let's just do a couple. I don't want to waste it. a couple of the worst nightmare gigs. I think these are interesting. Do you? Oh yeah. Do you ever do a, an out outdoor is really bad when you horrible, do like state horrible state state. I did a state fair with Sonny and Cher. I opened up for them. All summer in front of 15,000 people every other night. I don't know where I had the balls to do this. So I'm at the State Fair in Pennsylvania. 
And I'm there with a buddy of mine who was sort of like a muse for me. He was really, he was a pothead and he was funny. And we, and every time he laughed at a joke of mine, I'd write it down because I thought if he knew it, if he laughed, I would do it. So he's behind, I, I'm standing on the stage. I'm getting $500 a week and Sonny and Cher are getting, I happen to know this, $750,000 a show, okay? I'm on the stage and there's a track between me and the bleachers a quarter of a mile away are the people a quarter of a mile away, and it's at 4 o'clock and at 8 o'clock the show. I go on, and I'm racing through, you know, you race through with your act. Back then, I just did the same shit because I was supposed to do a half hour, and I got off in four minutes, and I said to my friend, I'm dead. I'm never, I'm, I'm dead. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm out of the business. So I run back to the, I run back to my hotel, and a guy, like an angel, says, Mr. Lewis, good show. I go, what do you mean a good show? I did four minutes. He says, last week, Bill Cosby was here headlining, and he did nine minutes. So he made me feel better. And then I came back wow. at 8 o'clock, and you would know this. When it's dark out and there's just a spotlight on you, they look at you. But when you're there at 4 in the afternoon, there's a fucking roller coaster, and there's, uh, and there's animals, uh, freakish animals from Africa with 12 humps and, you know, and 12 <laughs> penises. Yeah, they're not looking at you. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of bad gigs and corporate gigs. Do you do any corporate gigs anymore? Oh, my God. Corporate. Uh, oh, God. They hate. They they don't want entertainment. At they corporate. want singers. You yeah. Know, they're, 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 they, didn't, they didn't hire us. Someone who loves us said, oh, let's get Gilbert or Richard Lewis. We love them. But these people that go there, they don't care about us. They didn't buy tickets to see us. Those are the worst gigs of all. Dara the just worst. hung up a sign on the door, on the window. I think she's trying to remind you of a bad gig. It says Leno, oh. Leno outside. Oh, there. Oh, there was one outside. Is that the one? Yeah. A radio. One. It says the fuck, Le, uh, fu the fuck Leno, fuck fuck oh, outside oh, show. Oh, that was that was that one actually turned out well. Oh, it did. Yeah, it sounds I, good. It fuck does. Leno, fuck I, fuck. I, fuck. I, does. I did the uh, the clown. Um, what was the that? Clown? What's that clown? Boso? The no 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 the uh, Jerry Lewis. No, well they they were which? Oh, what? the Juggalos. The Juggalos. Who and the it was the, it was the weirdest gig I've ever done because they drove me, <laughs> and we go off the main <laughs> highway. <laughs> who are the jugglers? Just tell me who the jugglers are. It's a group of people, like it. It, it looks like like beyond the Manson family. But they like clowns. dress up as clowns. Yeah, they dress up as clowns. Yeah. Did they and murder I anybody? Actually, I actually. Did well there because I heard they throw knives at you. They throw <laughs> bottles. And I went up there and I started to say something. And I started to do obscure names. And I mentioned Zsa, Zsa Gabor and they all started chanting. It was an outdoor place. Oh, it was God, in the, the middle worst. of the forest. <laughs> because, you know, first they were driving me on the road. And then we were riding on gravel to where this is and and they started chanting fuck Sha Sha Gabor <laughs> and and then I said and I'm a big fan of character actor Lionel Atwell Jr. <laughs> Lionel and Atwell. they started chanting uh, fuck Lionel Atwell Jr. <laughs> It did was, you have to follow the juggalos or did they follow you or did you go on together? I was afraid they'd follow me uh, They, they it looked like I, I, that actually was not so much a not, it was a nightmare and how scary it was to be there, but I did well beyond anything, wow. but I did. What was the other? Now I can't remember a name. What's uh, our, the Go-Go's. Uh, Belinda Carlisle. I once. Oh, she's cool. I opened for Belinda Carlisle. Yeah. James Mason's daughter-in-law. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, and I remember her manager said to me, there's a lot of little girls and their mothers in the audience. <laughs> it's your and, crowd. And I tried to work clean and I was bombing severely. And then I just basically started doing every cunt joke I could think right. about. 
How many do you have approximately? Oh, it, I've lost. <laughs> I've lost count. You keep a book. If, if we were on a desert island together, right. I wouldn't well, run I, out I of hope, jokes. Really? Well, then that gives me a reason to want to marry you. <laughs> now, does she, does she, your wife gets loves you, so she gets all of this, right? She 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 grooves on it. Yeah. <laughs> does she, do you do you do you perform differently when your wife's in the audience than when she's not? Uh no. I know there are certain really. Bits. I do. There are certain bits she hates. I know one she right. is. And sometimes I'll go out of my way to do that one. <laughs> <laughs> and now we should talk because yes. you told me to avoid death and what you think of other comics. But I want to just say one thing. I did it the other night. I was on Jimmy and you might have not heard it, but it just, it just is like the worst example of a horror show. My 45 years ago, I was on Carson, my first shot. I was like in my early 20s. And they and they had 90 minutes. I was on like at six minutes to one. So I'm backstage. I'm petrified. I dressed up like a Jew Muppet in a blue suit <laughs> with blue <laughs> shoes. I don't know what I, I wasn't. I was ready, but I, I, I was petrified. And George Papad from the A-team was on oh, before yeah. me. And he was talking about how he was dying from lung cancer. And I'm backstage and the whole audience is crying. I can hear them crying. I'm crying. And Johnny says, well, how long do you have to live? He says, well, a couple of weeks. He goes, well, God bless you. And we wish you the best. And now for his first national appearance. <laughs> oh, <of> God. <laughs> I went into the toilet. Because, you know, you know, you forget when there's 300 people, Steve Landisberg, who I loved, who passed away, he said to me, if you're ever on a television and you're looking at that red light and there's only 300 people in the audience, this is a good tip for comics, and, he, and the joke doesn't go well, don't look like you're a piece of shit and you're, and you're going down. Smile. Because there's like 4 million people watching you and there's only 300 people in Burbank watching you, so... Forget the audience. Just make believe you're cooking, you know? And that was, but I didn't because I was crying and doing jokes at the same time. It was really a horror. So I had to wait six months to come back on the show because, uh, you know, Carson thought I was too physical. And thanks to Dave Letterman, he said to me, you know, you're good on Carson sometimes, but you, you move around too much and it looks amateurish. You know, the camera's steady. So he said, when you do my show, and this is in 82, he says, you never have to do stand-up again. And I never did stand-up ever on, on t TV since 82. Because of Dave, which was a cool, a real solid. Because I was too, you know, when you're running around the, the stage uh, and, and the camera's looking at you, you look like a fucking moron, you know. So Letterman knew that. So that was cool. What do you hear about his new show? Anything? Letterman's I think it's just a one-on-one -on -one yeah. interview show, kind of like what Costas used to do. Oh, really? Yeah, I think that's the format. How much fun did you have on Letterman show, Gilbert? I, I, liked, Le I liked doing Letterman. Yeah, me yeah, too. I did Letterman. I used to do stand-up there. And then l a few years later, when Leno had the Tonight Show, he used to always call me to do those skits. Oh, those game show oh, bits. Right. Yeah, yeah, all different oh, types right. of skits. And, and it was like... Those I loved doing. Right. Because it was like with, with those skits, it was like if you fucked up, the audience loved it even more. You used to do those cult sketches with Jack Riley, right? The, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah I, you did a I, couple of those. I Jack did. Riley was so great wonderful. Jack Riley, great yeah. guy. The great Jack Riley. Funny man. And they had me and Queen Elizabeth <laughs> and a few things. But You know, the first time I did my Tonight Show and it didn't work out because of the lung cancer story, the producer of uh, the Carson Show, who was, did Jack Benny's show, I can't think of his name now, he was the big producer of Carson. Oh, uh, 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 Freddie DeCordova? Freddie oh, DeCordova. Yes. Here's what I got. He opens my door in the dressing room and he says, be funny, and slammed the door. Oh, jeez. My st I farted so loudly. It was it, it, the whole, the whole t people were running out like it was like a, a monster movie in the in the offices. I couldn't help it. I was such a wreck. Between be funny and and lung cancer, how good can you be? You know. 
one time when I was on the Tonight Show, and it was funny because the first with time John, I was, with Johnny, with no, Johnny, with, with Leno, oh, with Leno, and, and and it was like the first time I was on, I had done panel, and right. I thought, oh, wow, well, cool. I did it, and I didn't think it was funny at all. But then, for some reason, they liked me and kept having me back for the skits. Just, oh, the skits and panel. Did you no, do not panel. panel. Just the they just had me do the skits, which was great, which was like a vacation. Wow. Did you ad-lib a lot or was it pretty well Oh, written? yeah, yeah. You. That's the great part about that. It was like you rehearse just like once quickly, and then if you fuck up and start uh, ad-libbing, the audience liked it much better than the actual bit. Right, of course. It's like when Carson bombed. That's when he was his best. Oh, yeah. He used to do the soft shoe and they do uh, play T for two. And the funny thing is with the Cordova, he was there and he was older and Leno kept him there. And it was right. And the Cordova asked one of the writers about me and he goes, right. who, who, who is that? And the guy goes, that's Gilbert Gottfried. He's he's known. He's been on a bunch of shows and movies. And, yeah. and he goes, oh, I thought he was just some kid who worked around here. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't Freddie DeCorder direct Bedtime for Bonzo with, with Reagan and the Chimp? With, I, he, he I might think have. He did. I think he did. Wow. Yeah, I believe he did. I was, with, I was flying to uh, New York. The, the 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 stop in New York to go to to go to Paris with an ex girlfriend, and Johnny was with one of his ex wives, and I was in the middle lane, in the middle row, and he was right next to me, and I have a lot of nervous tics and tremors. I used to have it much more than I do now, so for six hours, and my my girlfriend was next to me, I would turn my head slowly and stare at Carson, and he you know he got you know a little bent out of shape. And my girlfriend said, if you continue to stare at Carson, your career is over. I go, I can't help it. I'm, I'm obsessive compulsive. So for six hours, I kept turning my head, staring at him. So we land in the first class lounge. He was going to Wimbledon. And I went over to him and I said, Johnny, I'm nuts. I'm a mental case. I got a lot of emotional problems and I'm sorry for staring at you. And he giggled and he put me back on the show and I told the story on the show. So as long as you admit that you're crazy, they give you a shot, you know. <laughs> well, but you know, it, was, it what, was embarrassing, though. What I always what one of those things that attracted me about show business. Yeah. Was I thought if uh, if you're working in a grocery store and you're fucked up and neurotic then, you know, they'll they'll fire you and they'll go, what the hell's wrong right, with right. that guy? In show business, it's You get like, a series. Yes, yes. <laughs> Anything goes. You go, oh, he's so eccentric and brilliant, you know. I know, but they talk behind our backs all the time. They might be making a lot of money off of us, but, you know, as soon as, you know, they leave us, they go, uh... He's so fucking nuts. He's driving me crazy, you know. But they'll take the money. Yes. You know. Have you had a good record with managers and agents your mm, whole career? Not really, no. I, 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 I once had somebody tell me years ago that agents are Coca-Cola distributors. It's like <laughs> the phone rings. Uh, That's interesting. You no, know, we need... Uh, 10 cartons of Coca-Cola, all right, that'll cost you this much, and they uh, fill out a paper. You wouldn't have them if you didn't have to have them. Uh, you, wouldn't, yeah. you wouldn't have agents and managers yeah. at all if yeah. they weren't an, a necessary evil. And I always wonder what, have you ever had agents and managers give you advice? Once, once that I actually used. I used to bring notes on stage because it was four or five hours of new material. And to me, that was cool. Yeah. I thought it was cool. I thought people that came to see me say, Richard's never done this before. And I would look down. I'd have a piano on it. I did it at Carnegie Hall and Ve everywhere, specials. Because I figured, why not do new material? I just couldn't take doing other stuff that I knew. So one manager who I had literally for a day, 
He said, why don't you do it the regular way? Just go out there and hold the mic. I go, no, but I, I'll never remember more than 20, you know, five minutes of new stuff. He says, yeah, but it's a work in progress. I went, isn't that cool that it's a work in progress? And he says, no. For the audience, they, you know, he thought they expected. I used to be jealous of comics. They go, they fly, they land, they get a, they go, they get a hooker. They have lobster tail. They go on, they do A, B, C, D, Z, and I'm out there with my notes, not knowing what the fuck I'm doing. And uh, you know, and I totally lost the thread where I'm going. And you're looking at me now, like you should, you know, that I should leave the studio. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sorry. I lose the thread so fast, it's sad. You know, I, when I lose the thread on stage and then I come back to it 40 minutes later, they scream out, he's a genius. They have no idea. It's just my, my mental disability. I can't remember things. And that's good for my act. It's good. But the thing about the notes, the, oh, I know what it was. My I decided never to use notes again and I would stay in my hotel for hours, days, and look at new material, even though if I would only remember 10 or 15 minutes of it, my performance level was so anxious that I was better on stage. So I haven't done notes for 10 years, and I've, I'm glad about it. But at 70 years old, who gives a shit? <laughs> I mean, you know, who cares? I saw you at Westbury Music Fair working with notes with the piano. It never bothered me. It never distracted me. Many times I saw you work with notes. That's when Gilbert and I were doing, back in the days when I was doing a show with Jamie Lee, we would, that was the most fun for me. Me, Gilbert, Kinnison, we'd sit there with, How, with Howard and do and read the newspaper and, 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 and jam for three hours. How great was that? No, uh, those old Howard Stern days were those like. Those were the greatest ever, ever. Because he was phenomenal. He is phenomenal, but that's what I liked him the most. You know, and, and you know, I, I don't do the show as often anymore because he doesn't do that kind of show anymore. You know, I mean, I loved it. Sitting with you and getting drunk at seven in the morning and sitting there with <laughs> Kinnison with his with four triplets. I don't know who he had with him. You know, we had a great time, you know, I, and, and it was fun. Yeah, was especially fun. when he'd go. And, and now let's what's happening in the news. Oh, and yeah. That was the greatest thing. I know, but I, you know, I told Howard, I said, Howard, I love you. You're one of the greats in history. But, you know, it was great sitting with Gilbert and Belzer and doing the news. But for me to go over there and pick the shortest lesbian midget who has a, a, a yeast infection, <laughs> I, I can't. I, it's, not my, it's not my sweet spot. I, I, you know. And I think I offended him. I said, I'm not saying it's not funny. You're making a billion dollars a year. People love that. I just can't do it. So, you know, so be it. I was on his show for 30 years and I loved it and he helped my career. You still do his show a lot, don't you? Uh, no, not lately. It's changed. Really? Yeah. Yeah. How can he not love you? You can do any, you can do skits. Yeah. That, that, those were great years, though. I will say, oh, I mean. Yeah, the late people, 80s and the early 90s. Nothing, nothing topped that, yeah, man. Yeah, people still come up to me. It's like, They'll mention my name with him like we were Abbott and Costello. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, yeah, no, those were good times. You know, you know, I, I'll, I'll always treasure those times. You know, they fly by, but, you know, I'm glad we experienced it. You know, I mean, we, we had a lot of, we had a great time, you know. And, you know, I talk about, I was talking about some bad gigs, but that's all part of the fucking journey, man. You know, if you don't have if you don't have a bad gig, then you're not you're not in the business. You know, it's just that simple. Did you play Vegas and oh and those and casinos? Uh, I I've done I have done Vegas. I don't remember my ever doing great in. Ve I always thought Vegas audiences. How can you? They're wearing Bermudas and holding a cup. Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> you did say no, you had a bad like, gig in the Catskills. Yeah. Oh yeah. Cat skills, oh, I God. bombed severely. I did the Neverly. Ooh. The the owners loved me. The band loved me, but the audience, forget it. And and in Vegas, I kind of feel like the audience is like, well, let's see. We'll play. We've got this time to this time to play blackjack, and right. then we've got uh, these coupons for the buffet. 
Then we'll watch a comedian. Yeah, uh, and they that, com- and they comp that they they give about eight hundred out of a thousand tickets just to just to have people see a show. They don't care about making money on the show. They just care about them going back and gamble. You know, if you don't do, if you do, I read this somewhere. If you do a minute over your set, they lose like four million dollars in the gambling. Wow! So you, that's why you really. That's why when you look to the left, there's a guy with a gun with a silencer ready to shoot you in the temple, you know, and, and the, and the native American casinos, I'm, I, you know, I don't do a lot of them, but when I do them, you know, you meet the, the tribe before the show and you take pictures and they were, you know, they wear their hair back like these Italian waiters in Hollywood, you know, cause they can't wear it long and they have, and they're wearing Armani suits and, uh, I, I'm not sure what tribe this is. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I just don't know. But, you know, I'm glad the Native Americans are getting their money back. I mean, they got so fucked over in Manhattan. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine selling Manhattan for $12 and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and some uh, crystal meth? I mean, what the fuck? <laughs> you never had, you know, you you never, did you ever know that I was a drug addict and an alcoholic? Uh, yes, you, you talk about it constantly. No, but did you know it when we were sort of friends and we were working together? No, I just I just thought you were fucked up mentally. Do you guys remember I, meeting? Do you remember when it was? Oh yeah, we we were. Well, I left for L.A. in the mid seventies, and you were already you were in New York. Yeah, we were always running into each other at the clubs. Yeah, but you always wanted to hug me, and I got nervous. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> now you. It's funny. You're not the only alcoholic we've had on this well, show. Well, no, it's 23 years without a drink, so right. give me a give me a you know a favor. Former you know, alcoholic. Uh, former alcoholic. We, well, I am an alcoholic, but I'm not drinking anymore. We had uh, well, like Dick Van Dyke. Yeah, we had Dick Van Dyke. Big here, that's drinker. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Paul, uh, Paul Williams. Right. And they said they both like Dick Van Dyke said he was shy and to open up he would drink. Paul Williams said just to fit in with the crowd, he felt like comfortable drinking. So right. what what was it with you that made you have to drink? I wanted to forget my fear. And uh, I know it it medicated all the fear I had, but I had no, it, it, but it, I, it didn't dawn on me that it would fuck up my craft. You know, a lot of the times... You know, like in Carnegie Hall, I did a lot of hours. I did two hours, but I only had like one glass of wine like at noon because I wasn't going to ever fuck that up and blame it on alcohol. So, I, I, you know, I, you know, it's no excuse. My personal life was when I did Carnegie Hall, it was one of the best nights of my life. But then everyone sent me. I, I went to the dressing room, 15 bottles of, sh- of champagne. Wow. And by the, and by the time I came down... There was like 300 friends in a little party room in Carnegie Hall. I made a complete fucking asshole of myself. So my personal life was in disarray, but, you know, I, I basically did okay, you know, on stage and with the sitcoms and all that shit, but there's no excuse, you know. I'm glad I'm glad I'm done with that that part of it, you know. I hope, I think. And the you drinking know. got you into, like, doing... Were you into drugs? drugs? Yeah. At the end, at the end, I used to date a lot of women. which They weren't, like, druggies, but they did, you know, ecstasy and crystal meth, and they would say to me, you're so... You're not nice when you drink. You should just do drugs. What, what kind of... Th- what, thanks. You know, thanks yeah. a lot. <laughs> but I did, I, I did bottom out on crystal meth, you know, like, you know, Breaking Bad time, and... Uh, I called two friends. I thought I was going to die, and uh, I, they took me to Cedars, and uh, that was it, August 4th, 1994, and that was the end of it. But, uh, you know, I, there's this, David Brennan was one of my best friends. He, he, he gave me the f- breaks, for Tonight Show, Sonny and everything, and he was a great buddy of mine. And I went to see, I was broke, and I went to see his, like, th- four, four his, his brownstone in Manhattan when I was about 22, Everything was unbelievable. Like the stapler was like from, from uh, you know, uh, it could have been President Woodrow Wilson's stapler. <laughs> I said, how much does this stapler cost? $50,000. I went, and I had like no money. I went, how do you do this? And he says, jokes bought this house for me. And I always remembered that. So when I was bottoming out on crystal meth, I, I was in a very nice home in the Hollywood Hills. And I went to, I looked in the mirror and I went, jokes bought this fucking house. 
and I'm going to put this shit up my nose? What am I, a nut? So that's what did it for me. I, I remember what Brenner told me 45 years before, and, and that's what saved my life, I think. I, I, you know, it's funny. Pretty funny story. I yeah. usually do that. I usually open and close with that story. <laughs> That's your big ending. Because I, the last time I saw Brenner yeah. was in Vegas. And this was one of the nice memories of Vegas that they would have, I, twice I was at it, they would have these lunches that right. all the comics working Vegas that week would stop by this lunch and we'd and hang out. Any, would they do material or what? Well, they they kid around, not so yeah, much material. R they just right. kid back. And and I remember Brenner uh, sees me and he walks over and his face lights up. And of unlike course. you, I may add, <laughs> he Thank Brenner you. put his arms out and he said, "Come here, you." What did he say? He said, "Come here, you," and, and he gave me he gave me a big hug. Brent, Brenner was a great guy. Yeah, but I liked the hug. But you wanted to hug me for an hour and a half. I was having you, and I I and wanted some I thought some you were tongue. in love with me, and I didn't I didn't want to. I'm not bisexual, uh, and I didn't want to start. When, when when I saw you didn't hug me the first time, I chased you. Yeah, a few you blocks. You chased me for an hour. Yeah, I show up at the corner of each block. Would I, turn, I, I was going. I turn around. I tried yeah. to hide from you, and I then I would turn. I would look back. And there you are with your arms outstretched. <laughs> I was freaked. I was freaked out. Did I you really so want to hug him, or were you doing <laughs> a bit? Yeah, at no, that point, <laughs> I don't know what it was. I just think it was your brain. Yeah, at that but point, it, when I saw how scared you were a bit, that's what it was. When you said he doesn't want to hug me, you said I'm going to hug him if it takes to the end of the time. Uh, end of time. Yeah, I was up there at like every corner. That I'm you sorry. Got I'm sorry. I'm sorry about the depressing stories, but. You know, uh, I, I think people should know that it's not all a piece of cake, you know. Am I wrong? Am I right? Oh, absolutely. No, absolutely. It's good stuff. I now, mean, I could tell you when I fucked a female circus clown, and that would be funny, but, you know. Did you great. fuck a female <laughs> circus clown? Well, she was female. Oh, okay. <laughs> and she had a red nose and black high heels. <laughs> but she was 75 miles away from my house. And I, you know, I was dating somebody at the time and I said, do I really want to travel 150 miles an hour for, you know, for a six, you know, for an eight second orgasm? And I did. But then I realized that why should I do it? After the third time, I went 150 miles. What's the, you know, what's the point? So I, you know, masturbation is underrated. <laughs> You could it sign really up is. for that, Gil. Now, now, how did... If it's the same feeling, even though you're not there with the red-nosed clown with the black heels, <laughs> you still you still come. Wait a minute, and, Richard. Was she really and, a clown? Uh, yeah, she was a clown, and uh, and I was. She was best friends with the tall man, and uh, I was. And he died, and he wanted me to lift his his coffin into the cemetery, but I I didn't because. I had a hernia, and, it was, <laughs> now, and it, he was too tall. Another thing I've always heard about you is, unlike me, you take advan you used to take advantage of your uh, celebrityism and Wait get laid loads of times. <laughs> well, I take advantage of my celebrityism and do what? And get Wait. laid. What was that word? <laughs> celebrityism. Yes. <laughs> What kind of language? This is like a, <laughs> you mean a celebrity. And I heard <laughs> this reminds me of going out to dinner with the guy on Jeopardy. <laughs> I went out with Phyllis Stiller and him for two hours. I said, "Pass the salt." He went, "Salt." That was in 1813 by Prince Prince Gottlieb. I went, "Shut the fuck up! I can't take it." Give me. Can I borrow your ketchup? Ketchup. Ketchup was invented by Einstein by mistake when he cut his wrist. I couldn't take it. He knew every fuck. No, I didn't take advantage of my celebrity. People just wanted to go out with me. What the fuck, man? See, but I heard, and please what tell me hear? this is true. <laughs> please tell hear? me this is true. I heard. Just because I fucked the circus clown, you don't have to be jealous. <laughs> yeah, I am. 
I I heard that you used to like you'd be sitting around watching yeah. TV, yeah. and a commercial would come on. Oh, with and a I hot... would call and and I would find the names of the people. Yeah, there'd be some hot looking uh, girl in the commercial, yes. and go you'd say, oh, how did I, you how did you know this? I, I didn't do it a lot, but I did. I did date a lot of models from commercials, and you and I would I'd call the ad agency. This is Richard Lewis. I'm doing. I'll be. I'll be honest. This is this is a character defect. I'm doing a series, and uh, she's f- perfect. To play oh, gee. <laughs> and you think I can have her agent's number? And uh, she said, "Well, I'm her agent. Well, can you give her? Here's my number. Have her call me." And then that was the end of that. Then we dated. So and, you're right. I'm a scumbag. And did you ever use these girls on the show? Yes, I once dated a. Uh, a Miss uh, a Miss uh, Universe, I, and, I, and she wasn't going to get the role. And I asked one of the stars, "You got a booker?" And he did. And we dated, but I blew it because she came over to my house at two in the morning, and I was drunk in my bed. And she rang the bell, and I didn't answer it. And she said, "I never want to see you again." So you know, there's a downside to these stories, you know. But you did but get laid. You did fuck Miss Universe. I'm getting laid right now while we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> I got laid a lot, but I mean, I got married at 57. I wasn't what I wasn't, you know, a monk, you know, I love women. I love intercourse. The hell. Well, what, you, you, you're upset with me? Yes. <laughs> He's just envious. You, you don't, you don't know the amount of, uh, of jerking off I've done in my well, career. Well, did you actually turn these girls away that, can, that, that would wish. approach you at, at gigs? Yeah, I I never remember, like, I, everyone tells me, like, oh, there are these towns. Yeah. Comedians go there, and and the girls there think comedians are like rock stars, and they're right. begging to fuck you. And I thought, well, when where is this town exactly? <laughs> I'm still looking for it. Well, you don't have to look for it. You just you just have to. I don't. You know, you you're, you're too down on yourself. You just go to a club. They all they recognize you. They sit with you. You buy a drink, and if they like you, you you take them out for a, you know for for dinner. And then if you want to make love, you make love. What's the difference? Simple, uh, Gil. You know. Yeah. See, it's much easier. For <laughs> see, you. you had it. You did it wrong. I heard things about you. With all the respect, you wanted to do it. You didn't. Even, you didn't want to spend money on dinner. So you said. Do you mind if we fuck in the car? <laughs> you know, I always wanted to get in. I, I always wanted to get in the Mile High, the Mile High Club. You know, the Mile High Club. I'm oh, sure yes. you weren't in it. You weren't in it, right? No, no. So I was on a flight. No one was on the flight but me in the ba- and I was in coaches. It's like 1980, and I was making out with one of the flight attendants, and I and she looked at the bathroom. I went, "This is my chance." This is my chance to be in the Mile High Club. And she had all of the flight attendants block off the last third of the, of the. they they did it for her and me. Wow. No one was allowed to use the bathrooms in the back. So I go into the, but I have two bad knees. So I go, <laughs> I get into the bathroom. It's totally impossible unless you're a rubber man to do it. So she, she pleased me, to be honest. Okay, to be frank. And then she says, what about me? I went, first of all, I need at least an hour, an hour and a half to get ready for this. And she <laughs> says, what do you mean an hour? I said, well, I just, you know, had an orgasm and I just, you know, I'm not a, you know, I'm not, you know, Batman. <laughs> you know? So then she got on the sink with a, you know, in the position and I started crying from pain because I had two trick knees. I went, I can't do it. <laughs> And she said, you son of a bitch, you fuck. She hated me. So she told all the stewardesses, flight attendants, that she did something to me. She did me. She blew me. Okay? Yeah. And I didn't do anything to her because my knees were hurting. So when we, <laughs> when we landed in LAX, there was no one on the flight but me and the flight attendants and the pilots. She told everybody that I was a scumbag. And I was getting my bag, and all of the flight attendants went, you piece of shit, <laughs> you self-centered <laughs> scumbag. I was never so humiliated in my life. 
<laughs> so I, I, I was in the half mile club. I think I'm in the half mile club because I did have an orgasm, but I didn't have intercourse. I think you have to have intercourse, but I don't know how people do it. It's just impossible. It's impossible. Was that your you stumbling ever... block, Gilbert? Were you unwilling to pay for the dinner? Ah, uh, that um, and my just general personality. <laughs> I always, it. you know, what scared me about trying yeah. to get laid after a yeah. show? Oh, was, after a show, yeah. Uh, yeah, is that when you're on stage, you're like the king, you're a god right. to them. Right, right. And then I, I would always feel like, and then when I talk to some girl <laughs> out in the bar, I feel like, like, just like the lowliest piece of shit. What, because you're not on stage anymore? Yes, yes. Interesting. How many times did you have great sex after a show, you think? Oh, God. That would that I could count on a hand. <laughs> and really? I, I used my, my hand for several reasons. What, did you ever have a conversation with your penis after you had an orga, after you masturbated and say, why are we doing this alone? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean... I, I, you could. <laughs> I, I, I mean, can't your tell penis you. Could be very, your penis could be very angry with you. Cause the penis is, is not happy with your hand. The penis wants to meet women. I, I can't or men. I can't tell you the amount of times <laughs> yeah. that I got into a talk with a girl after the show and the girl would say to me like, hey, you, you want to come out? Uh, you doing anything now? You want to come out, like have some well, you, drinks and you, go over? Well, to... you know what that means. That means let's get let's fuck. Well, yeah. wait, and then <laughs> oh so God. I would think, well, this is great. You know, Christ has returned to the earth, <laughs> and I'm gonna get pussy now. And and then she go, oh great, my boyfriend's pulling up the car now. And, uh, or her husband. Yeah. And, and that they would want me to go out like, you know, just. Oh, it'd be that like, let's, let's go out and get some, go to Chuck E. Cheese. Yes, exactly. I see. I hope Jermaine Greer is not listening to this podcast, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> this one is the one most sexist I've ever been in my entire life. And I'm not a sexist, but with you, you bring it out of me. <laughs> You were forcing me to tell you how much I love women. See, I, I've already got you to talk about pussy and alcoholism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, this is like, you know, this is like, you know, I'm, I'm being, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm on some uh, third world country. They've kidnapped me and you're giving me tape. You're telling me what to show to America. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much the show, Rich. This is what the show is. Yeah, pretty much. You try to ruin people's reputations. <laughs> But you can't you can't ruin mine. I have a decent reputation, and you have the best reputation. Everyone thinks you're the funniest comedian that ever lived. Honest to God, really? You know that? He's among them they for sure. I swear. You know, there's different comics. You know, with Pryor and Carlin and Lenny and Klein and all these guys and and Sarah and there's the, the list. But but just for pure funny, un, and with pure surprise. I'm not just saying this. I mean this. You are the funniest human being I have ever known. Oh, thank you, Rich. What a compliment. Unfortunately, your penis is the most unhappy person. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of your testicles? Do you think your testicles have any bearing when you get older that <laughs> your, pe your penis is embarrassed how it looks between them? Now, here's something I wonder about. And yeah. I don't know if you're experiencing this. I'm, I'm when, sure I will. When, when I'll see old guys... And, in the shop, and, and, at the gym, yeah, when you're at, at the gym at so the much, gym or even with their pants on. I see. You, and do you go? You go into a sauna naked with guys? <laughs> I I I once tried that, couldn't do it after that. <laughs> but I mean, if you see, I see with, these uh, old guys fully dressed, yeah. and you could see that it looks like they have a tremendous dick, it's but it's balls. just that the dick and balls are hanging so low. Right, you can't really tell. It's like a, it's like a cantaloupe. <laughs> you know, balls are useless. <laughs> balls are useless. But uh, you know, but you're getting older now, and you're, and you're married, and you don't have to worry so much. You know, 
You really don't have to. Yeah, Gil, you don't relax. have to. You don't have to have. You know, intimacy comes in different flavors. You don't have to have. You don't have to stick your penis in somewhere to be intimate. You know, you can. You know, you can watch. Uh, you know, uh, a Fellini movie and, and and hug your wife and not and feel that you're doing something good. Or maybe the two of us can hug and watch Fellini. <laughs> well, call me. You have my cell. <laughs> Or Cassavetes, uh, Richard's into Cassavetes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Cassavetes is Cassavetes and Jenna Rollins are my two favorite couples. Oh, the best. And I heard best. both of us. Uh, Frank told me that both of us have something in ca- that we were both guest programmers. Oh, on Turner uh, Classic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Richard picked yeah, two I did, Keaton I films. I did Buster Keaton. I, uh, Buster's my man. I love Buster. And I did, who did you do? I Jerry? did. I picked four movies. Well, I picked a bunch. And oh, but you didn't it. do like a uh, an essay. You did four favorite yes. movies. Yeah. So oh, yeah, uh, cool. the original of Mice and Men Beautiful. with Lon Chaney Jr. and Burgess right. Meredith. Right. Uh, Freaks that Todd Ooh. Browning directed. Oh, yeah. Johnny Eck. Uh, the those, con- those were the people you met at the bar after you yes. <laughs> Legless men. Oh, The Conversation with Gene Hackman. Yeah, un- underrated. Yeah, it's great. And, and uh, the, swimmer. The, the Swimmer with Burt Lancaster. Wow. I got a movie for you that you got to see. There's two movies. I just saw one. Did you see, have you been watching Fargo at all, the series? N- no. Yeah, it's pretty great, It's isn't one it? of the great TV series. There's three, there's three years, ten episodes. The first one has B- Billy Bob and, and Odenkirk. It's great. Yep. But the third season, the second one is fine. The third season has is unbelievable. It has this English actor who is a genius, and I can't pronounce his name. And he did a movie in 1990. You like dark films? Oh, Yeah. Then you have to get naked. It's called naked. Oh, David Thewlis. Yes, Thewlis. Oh, yeah. he. Yeah. You yeah. know. You know yeah. what, what he a was fucking in. Fucking movie. Yeah. yeah, he's in the Big Lebowski. Quickly. He he was also in the the well film that's famous for being terrible, The Island of Doctor. Oh Moreau yes, he's in the Brando. Oh, yeah, but Brando get all Moreau. that. You gotta yeah. see. Promise me you'll see naked and call okay, me. Okay. Now now here's something. I don't know if I should discuss Does it matter it? that we've been here three hours? It doesn't matter to you, <laughs> yeah. does it? Here's something. <laughs> we'll I wrap could, it up soon, I Rick. could either discuss with you or. Go on. I, I, I'm fearless. When we have Mr. Skin back, I Who's saw Mr. this Skin? actress, oh, okay. Elizabeth Winstead, in an, in an episode of uh, Fargo on his website where she stands up and you see her ass. It must be the third season that I haven't seen yet. Yes. Third season is insane. Is that you and the McGregor, third. right? In the third season? Yes, he plays yeah. two roles. I haven't gotten now, to it yet. Now, the I first two to, are great. We have to name names, and you just quickly tell Spike us. Spike Jones. Okay. <laughs> Don, Don Rickles, you did a series. Well, I, yeah, it was short lived, but to be with him for six months was unbelievable. You know what happened once he was walking? There was a poor homeless guy, and, uh, and Don and I were walking. Actually, it was Joe Bologna, too, who passed away. He was a good friend of mine. He was a wonderful man, a great writer and actor. And and uh, he was walking, and the homeless guy ha- put his hand out, and he sa- and Don gave him a $20 bill, and he took no prisoners like you. And he says, here, buy yourself a ranch for $20. <laughs> and the homeless guy pocketed the 20 put his hand back out, and went, I'm going to need some fucking cattle. <laughs> That's great. And then Don just gave him like a couple of hundred dollars. He just, he, he, he floored him, you know. But Don wow. was like, it's like being with the Rat Pack. It was unbelievable. Well, you mentioned Phyllis Diller. Tell us about your friendship with Phyllis Diller, too. Well, she was a big fan of mine, unbeknownst to me. She saw me at Caroline's when I was in my in, in the 80s, and she wrote me a letter, and she, she said she wanted to meet me and my wife, and we became best friends, and she took us out to dinner with all these strange directors, I mean, not strange, but famous older directors and comedians. Wow. And, and it was, she was just, you know, after two martinis, she was one of the, she was funny, and, but she was a painter, she was a pianist. She, she was just, you know, she's a, she's iconic. Yeah. And she wrote a, a, an autobiography that I totally recommend. It's, 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 she, you know, she had four or five children. One was mentally, uh, you know, ill. And she she left her family basically because she was so passionate about comedy. 
she and her husband let her do this. She went to San Francisco and the you know the the purple onion and the hungry eye, and she became a comedian. And uh, she had to do it, which I love that she had to do that. You know, it's uh, she was something. And uh, but that's when I was mentioning the guy from Jeopardy because I was sitting next to him at a dinner and he drove me crazy. I almost stabbed him. Was a contestant on the show? No, the host. Of oh, Jeopardy. Alex Every, Trebek. Alex, everyone loves him. He's a great mm-hmm. guy. Right. But every time I said anything, he had an answer, and I couldn't take it. I said, how's the fish? You know, fish really wasn't made with crust. I said, Alex, you have to shut the, you got to shut up. I'm going to I'm gonna snap. I'm going to fucking snap. Now, but Don, 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 how about this? We had this series. It didn't work out. It was a lot of problems with it. And I had a girlfriend at a time that had long hair down to her back. In ringlets, or not ringlets, it was whatever, uh, whatever you call them. And it was a party for Don and I, given by the producer. And I walk in to, I see Don and his wife, Barbara, and I'm there with my ex girlfriend. And I say, Don, this is my girlfriend. And he looks at her and he goes, Lose the hair and get back to me. And he never talked to us for <laughs> the entire party. <laughs> Lose the hair and get back to me. Fantastic. And here's the best one of all. I wrote about this when with Rodney, we we all loved. Yeah. And he was a big, he drank a lot and did a lot of drugs and like we all of us did. And he loved me and I loved him. And I used to, and so he, whenever I had a tonight show, all I cared about was taping this six minutes, going back to my house and listening to it. Because that's all that mattered, you know, drinking and when women and women and nothing mattered except that. Because David Brennan once said, "You do one Tonight Show, it's like doing the Improv, three shows a night, seven days a week for a hundred years. That's how many people watch you, six million people. So you better not walk through any of this shit." So I always took it very seriously, and that's good advice for anybody. A lot of you see a lot of guys just jerking around on TV or on radio. A lot of people are listening to you and watching you. So I was in the improv doing my my Tonight Show set, and I see Rodney. He goes, "Hey, Richard, you'll join me, huh? I don't do a good impression." And that meant we'd close the club, look for women, get drunk, smoke a joint, and see what happens. You know, and I didn't want to stay there till two. I wanted to get home at 10 and listen to my tape. So I lied to him and I said, and he's so dark and so funny. I said, Rodney, and I lied. I went, I feel like shit. And he went, hey, great. You're halfway there, you know. <laughs> great. You're halfway there. <laughs> what That's the? great. And I froze. I went halfway there. How can you not stay with this guy? You know what he called, you know, he, call, he he called everything around him, all the air, the heaviness, which I love. I'll tell you, there's all heaviness around me, you know, the heaviness. But you hung out with him. Did you ever do I, his club? Were you too young to do yeah, it? Yeah, I, what I remember about Rodney was one time I was doing, you know, one of his later movies. He, uh, Wally Sparks. Wally Sparks. Yeah. And then I did Back by Midnight, which I've never even seen. And I remember uh, he was in the in the makeup chair, and the makeup girl goes, uh, Rodney, uh-huh. when are you going to be happy? And he goes, when am I going to be happy? I'll be happy the same day Gilbert's happy. <laughs> <laughs> he knew you. Oh, God. That, that, you should take that as a badge of honor. Oh, absolutely. I was so proud yeah. of that. Um, how about Jonathan Winters, Richard, another guy you well, had a friend, long friendship with? He was my with. best friend for 10 years. He was, he was sober 52 years. He had the same family situation. He was like a father to me, and Phyllis was like a mother to me because— my father died before I performed. My mother had a lot of emotional stuff going on. My brother and sister were gone before I even did anything. I mean, not gone, but they were out of the house. So Jonathan and I were buddies. I used to drive up to Santa Barbara and take him out for, take him out for for brunch. You know, guys who have money like that from the old days, money is they just think they're gonna lose. You heard this, uh, you guys? They're gonna lose all their money. They money is sure. all important to them. Yeah. So when I would come, when I would do a club and they would say, I will give you $2,000 for the airfare and all this bullshit, you know, I would say, I want it in cash. I want it in tens and fives. 
So I, let's say I had two clubs. So I'd come back with, let's say, $4,500 in cash. I would go to pick up Jonathan, take him to the Biltmore, and then he and he and money was all for, he just thought money was the most important thing. I mean, he was a great artist too, and everything else, and the king of improv, I might add. But I would go over to his to his chair, and I had a bag of five thousand dollars, and I would empty the money on his head and on his plate, and he went crazy, like screaming, "Money, money!" <laughs> and he was trying to take the money and put it in his suit pocket and his pants pocket. He just, you know, some of these old guys, you know, when they're poor, back in the 30s and the 40s, yeah. they think they, they think they're going to lose it again. I heard Groucho. Groucho was the same person yeah, I was thinking yes. of. Yeah, Groucho was terrified. Yeah, didn't he walk around with a tomato in case uh, in case he ran out of food? <laughs> oh, that's so I heard this crazy thing that he, he would he could always get juice or water or some kind of nourishment out of the tomato. Well, tomato is one thing, but Rodney always had his schlong hanging out with his robe open. And he hated children. He was like W.C. Fields. He did not want to do proms like in the summer. So he would call the clubs in New York. Hey, Richard, you want to make 75, huh? Come on over. So I came over to the club. You know, $75 was a lot of money when you were broke, you know. So here's the, intro the worst introduction in history. He comes down. <laughs> his schlong's hanging out. They're all sitting. They're sitting there with their corsages and their white, you know, and their tuxedos. He doesn't want to even go on the stage. He goes to the corner of the stage. I walk up to the mic, and here's what he doesn't mention my name, no credits. He goes, Hey, you're going to like this guy. He's got hair, you know? <laughs> that was the introduction. So then I go, up, I go upstairs and I order a steak. And then he gets up, and he was a sink in his dressing room, and he pisses in his sink. And it was like a fog of piss. <laughs> All over my dinner, and I went right, and there was a bathroom down the hall. But he rather piss in his dressing room. Wow! And I went, Rodney, why did you piss in your sink? I can't eat. He says because I'm too big a star to walk down the hall. You know, that's the kind of guy he was. <laughs> you know, he oh would say God. these. I odd remember things. working on that movie with him. You know, he said yeah. to me at one point, he said, "Who oh, you working right now?" And I said, "No, I think we're breaking for lunch." And he goes, well, you know, come back to my trailer. We'll sit and bullshit. <laughs> and, and we're eating together. And right. he's got most of the food on his face, the way right. he would eat. <laughs> and then at one point, he picks up a piece of bread, wipes his face oh, with boy. the bread, and eats the bread. Incredible. Yeah. That's you don't first. think he was trying to put makeup on? <laughs> the first. Now, oh, uh, two other people, two other people we lost oh, yes. recently. Yeah. Who you oh, were Gar with. Gary and Robin, of course, two years ago. Oh, boy, yeah. Who well, else are we talking about? Well, Shelly Berman. Yeah. Oh, Shelly. Oh, yeah. God. One of the great improvisational guys of all. You know, he, he, he took the lead from Nichols and May and did emotional you know, personal stuff with car you know, with family and with, with dating and women. But, you know, he did, he, he had a, he, his routines were really tight. And Lenny Bruce, Lenny Bruce always remarked, he used to tease, he used to tease uh, Sher B Berman, who he couldn't handle any noise, like Larry David. He used to, you know, you know, he used to storm oh, yeah. off the stage. If anyone would talk, he would leave. And I go, Larry, they're ordering a drink. It's a fucking nightclub. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nightclub. They have to make money. Yeah, but they weren't listening. I go, yeah, but they were. They just ordered a scotch. Give them a break. <laughs> Larry would, like, get into, like, fights with people in the audience. Well, Susie told us he would look at the crowd and then just assess it and say, nah, I don't oh, think so, yeah, and walk yeah. off. He didn't yeah, like he the did looks that. of the crowd. I was really famous. I don't think so, without even saying a line. Yeah. Yeah, he was some, but he was a great comedian, a great stand-up. He really was. He was very authentic and wonderful. So tell us and about the next season of Curb, Richard. Well, it starts October 1st. I've seen most of the shows. I think it's the best season yet. Larry wouldn't do it unless he thought he could top himself. He did. It's dark. It's edgy. And I'm really proud to be in it. And uh, it, it, it starts in, a three, in October 1st. And... Uh, and it's cool. I know I'm, I'm you know I'm very fortunate that he was uh, that that we were born in the same ward. 
So sorry. Do we still have time to do it? Oh, oh. I'm sorry, huh? I'm late now. It's too late for lunch? It's too late for lunch and it's too late for my career and you fucked me with Tesla. He's, he's not working out? He sucks! He doesn't know comedy. I know he, that, he I be, know. He should be selling fabrics. Why'd you hire him? How did you! My friend of 47 years, you recommended oh, him. I recommended him. When I called you, I told you that he asked me to recommend him, so I'm Why? recommending him. You know, I put quotes around Why'd him. Why'd you recommend him? Would you miss Mr. Cole? I thought that you would pick up that it was a non-recommend recommend. You know, life is very brief, okay? And you know I need a good series. Is life too short? You think it's too short? Yeah. It's too short, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, but now my life is fucking way short. I'm you sorry, ruined I... my fucking pilot because of your recommendation. I can see if it came from a from a skinhead. Yeah. Or one of Bin Laden's people. You you're, called you're him Ben like... Laden or Bin Laden? I don't know. You called him Ben. That's almost like a Jewish name. <laughs> That's you true. Know? Ben Laden does sound like a shirt maker in Manhattan. Yes, doesn't? I know. Go to yeah. Ben Laden. Yeah. They got great colors. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You knew each other from summer camp? Oh, yeah. We were born in the same hospital three days apart, and then we went to this camp, and I hated his guts. He was a langy ass, langy <laughs> piece of shit, scumbag, cheater. I used to beat him with a baseball. We had fist fights. I hated him. We were 12. Never <laughs> saw him again. Usually, if you go to a camp, you say, hey, I want to go to, let's go to Radio City. Our fathers will drive us. We'll meet, you know. So we never saw each other again. And then I was a comic for two years before him. He was a fan. And we became best friends. I mean, inseparable. And one day I was drinking uh, after he became a comic. And after our sets, it was like one in the morning. And I said, there's something about you that spooks me. And he, goes, and he gets, you know, he gets nervous. Oh, I go, yeah. he says, what? And we retraced our childhood. And I went, well, I... I lived in New York, and then I lived in Brooklyn, and then I lived in Jersey. And he says, I lived in Sheepset Bay. And then I went to this sports camp, and I went, I went to a sports camp. He says, yeah, I went to this camp up in New York State. He says, so did I. And then I went, you're that fucking Larry David? You're that fucking Richard Lewis? I mean, it was a billion to one shot that Isn't we it? were best friends, and we never knew each other since we were 12. Right. And then we were best friends at 24, and we were, I mean, it's unbelievable. So we're really bonded in a in a cool way. Oh, and getting back to Jonathan Winters and a few people uh, like that. Winters was he was certifiable. Also. Yeah, he had two nervous breakdowns. He was sober, but he he had a lot of problems with his with family and his mother and his everybody. But he was a you know I wish he would have performed more, but he was too freaked out to perform. But I heard like. And this is something I've thought about a bunch of times, and I think a lot of people think it. Uh, Jonathan Winters, I think, was scared of being like psychiatrist and analyst. Oh, that, that he'd lose it. Yeah, he'd lose yeah, the comedy. He, he'd lose that magic. Interesting. What, 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 that if he went to a psychiatrist? Well, yeah, if you went to a psychiatrist and they, I've always compared it to like, you know, uh, an oyster gets an irritation, and by oh dealing with the irritation, it makes a pearl. Always a clitoris joke with you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and no, so— No, I understand. I never. He never told me that, but it could be true. But I think that he was worried, more worried about, you know, fear of failure, even though he was so brilliant. But were you scared, times you've been to analysis— that they're going to straighten you out and you're going to be happy and content. You won't ever be funny again. No, because they never did. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> That's a perfect answer. Oh, and yeah. I got to I got to ask one more person who died. Are you a friends with Jerry Lewis? Very much. So. He was very kind to me. He said really great things to me. And uh, he, want, he wanted me to go down to his. He had a boat in San Diego. So I, he told me to call him. So I made a mistake. It's not that funny, but it, was, it scared me. I, I called him, and, I, and, he's, and I called his business manager. And he says, I told you to call me at my house. I want you to come down with your wife and spend some time on the boat with his wife and his young daughter. And, uh, but he said, get a pencil. And then he says, I said, why? He says, and he was talking like straight, like he did in uh, in the in the De Niro movie. Oh know? yeah, yeah, that serious voice. Oh sure. And he says, 
And he says, so write this down. Because this is my home. And I, and I, <laughs> and I collapsed. I thought I had a stroke. I, you know, he went He went from the Nero movie <laughs> to, the, you know, to the Jerry movie, you know. Yeah. He, but, you know, I, I, we can talk forever about him. You know, the, what he did f- with film and, what, and, and as a writer and, you know, you, you, you know, the guy was something. I know he had, we all have personality defects and everything. And, but so what? The guy was a genius. That's all I know. I'm, I mean, I, my favorite Jerry Lewis thing is that they, they dedicated uh, the Friars Club building to him or one wing of it. And it was outside and everyone was going up making these speeches. And I wound up uh, standing next to Jerry Lewis. Oh, I heard this. That picture was phenomenal. Yeah. And and Jerry Lewis would like start heckling people, honoring him. And then he would turn to me and grab my arm and squeeze it and laugh like he wanted to tug me into his... His world. A thrill for a jokes. kid, right? Who grew up wow. on Jerry yes. Lewis. Yes, yeah, yes. It was- That's beautiful. By the way, I just want you to know, Gilbert, in three, in three weeks, yeah. I, was sit- I was at the fries before I fell off my roof, and I said, I know Billy Crystal has a room, and, uh, and Frank Sinatra and George Burns. I want a fucking room. I want- <laughs> and here's the room I want. There's no rooms left, but this is what I want anyway. And they're naming the bathroom after me. It's the Richard Lewis John for Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, great. So oh. if you're in, it's October 11th. If you want to come down and pull the curtain when, uh, you know, you're invited, we can have lunch. Oh, fantastic. And, great. And the, the chance that you're going to, I'll pay, by the way. That helps. Oh, that, yeah, that'll, then get, I'll, that, that'll that, get them there, Rich. <laughs> now, you don't have to come, that, but they're named the bathroom. But the bath, it's the Richard Lewis John at the Friars now. If you pay, I'll come there and I'll fuck you. <laughs> well, you don't have to pay me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's been, look. A, it's, it's been great to be with you, and thank you for having your genius friend with you because he's fantastic. Without him, you'd, it would be a tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take the compliment, Richard. Wow. No, By the way, I know true. Carl Totolo is an old friend of mine. Carl Totolo and I wrote world. that book. Yeah, 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 he's uh, he's a he was my teacher at school of visual arts. He's a great talent. He was, yeah, he's a brilliant talent. We wrote that uh, reflections from hell together. He did the yes, he did the the photographs. Absolutely. Well, this has been Gilbert Gottfried's amazing colossal podcast with my sidekick. (laughs) (laughs) Now I'm back. I've been bumped down a sidekick again with my boy Wonder. (laughs) I am not putting the tights on (laughs) (laughs) with my valet. (laughs) <laughs> Aide de camp. Yeah. <laughs> Look at this. With my co-host Frank Santo Padre. I'm Key Luke. All of a sudden. Yeah. <laughs> Richard, next time we we do this, we'll just talk movies. We'll just talk about Lumet and Cassavetes and uh, Bogdanovich and all your pa- your film passions. Well, I'll probably be dead by then, but fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And and just, just from that not. line alone. From the I'll Be Dead Soon, we know we've been talking to the very funny Richard Lewis. I love you, Gilbert. I love you guys. Thanks for having me. Oh, Richard, this was great. You. Thank you. And by the way, I'm not fucking you at the Friars. <laughs> I'll make sure he's there on the 11th, Richard. No, I have no intention of seeing his penis. <laughs> Thanks for making time for us. This was fun. Thank you, no, Richard. It, it was fun. And by the way, if you want me to lend you my... Uh, Penis Black Book. I will. <laughs> Any other plugs, by the way, before we run away? No plugs. I'm just doing a lot of gigs. The the mat, the uh, tracks of my Fears tour, and uh, I'll be performing through January. And I don't need the plug. And They're season nine of Curb, of course. Not, yeah, October first, Curb starts again. Fantastic. That thanks that's... for having me. I love you guys. Oh, thank Thanks, you, Rich. Richard. Take care.